good afternoon to everyone and thank you to PIDS and Dr. Arbeta for inviting the UP Center for Integrative and Development Studies to contribute in your very important webinar. Let me share my uh, uh, screen. Okay, I hope you can already see my uh, uh, my slide. So, as uh, mentioned by Ma'am Sheila, what I'll be presenting to you would be some of the lessons learned from our three-year study on Super Typhoon Yolanda. We did our study uh, before the pandemic, but uh, I think some of the observations and some of the lessons that we pointed out in our publications can still be useful as we prepare better for uh, future disasters. Okay, so very briefly, I'll not uh, uh, discuss point by point the outline of my presentation, but I'll give you a brief background of our research, what we did, and then uh, since uh, I'm a political scientist, I will focus on the multi-level governance structure in terms of disaster risk reduction and management and uh, look at how they operated during Super Typhoon Yolanda and afterwards during the relief and rehabilitation stage, what uh, have been the impacts of interventions on, uh, we use the framework of human security and resilience in our study, and uh, of course the lessons for disaster risk governance and resilience. And incidentally, uh, this is the 10th year of uh, Super Typhoon Yolanda. So it's also good to look back and see uh, some of the lessons. Have we learned our lessons from that very devastating uh, Super Typhoon? So um, without uh, dealing so much about our project background, it's a project in partnership with the University of Nottingham of the United Kingdom. It's campus in China and the University of the Philippines. Funded by the United Kingdom's Economic and Social Research Council and the Department of Foreign and International Development. And the implementing unit of um, this research in UP Diliman is the depart my department, the Department of Political Science. But uh, of course, uh, we cannot we were not uh, we would not have done the entire research without the help of other UP campuses, in particular UP Visayas in Tacloban and uh, which is now uh, an autonomous um, unit of, of uh, the University of the Philippines and uh, our colleague, our quantitative uh, expert for the project is from UP Manila. So it's a three year project which runs from March 2015 to 2018, and our uh, overarching aim would be twofold, to identify strategies that work in relation to poverty alleviation in post-disaster um, environments, and to ascertain the conditions necessary for the success and scaling up of these strategies based on the case of relief efforts in selected Yolanda area. We focus on urban population risk, the vulnerability to disasters and resilience towards environmental shock. And we use the framework of resilience and human security. Our practical objective is to assess 20 barangays across Leyte uh, affected by Yolanda, and we selected Tacloban City, Palo, and Tanawan. Uh, we use uh, a number of uh, research methods, documentary review, key informant interviews of various stakeholders, household surveys, focus group discussions, and family interviews. And we repeated the process for three years to see how people uh, ha assess their situation uh, during, uh, before, during, and after uh, Super Typhoon Yolanda. So in terms of uh, our framework, we use human security and resilience. When we say human security, we're looking at it in terms of three dimensions, freedom from fear, freedom from want, and freedom to live in dignity. According to the Human Security Report, 
when we talk about human security, it addresses the protection of people, meaning both individuals and communities, from critical and pervasive threats to their lives, livelihood, and dignity, including the downside of development. In terms of approaches, it is composed of the top-down or protection approaches, as well as the more important bottom-up or empowerment uh, approach. In terms of resilience, we refer to it, according to, to quote Rodan, as the capacity of any entity, an individual, a community, an organization, or of a natural system to prepare for disruptions, to recover from shocks and stresses, and to adapt and grow from a disruptive experience. So definitely, Resilience is linked intimately with vulnerability and capacity to address the vulnerability. And uh, it focuses generally on marginalization as a source of vulnerability. And in that process, it is very much um, linked with the human security approach. So the human security approach targets the vulnerable and directly addresses factors that increase vulnerability to poverty, disease, conflict, and disempowerment. It also requires mechanisms to be established at different levels of government and to focus on governance to protect communities from threats. Communities, particularly the marginalized, like uh, the urban poor, the persons with disabilities, uh, women, uh, and uh, other marginalized sectors are the most effect effective locus of disaster preparedness activities and hence must define their own resilience. And uh, in our study, we paid particular uh, attention to two areas of post-disaster resilience, shelter and livelihood. As uh, Director Orbeta mentioned, the Philippine setting definitely is geographically prone to natural hazards. It's in the Pacific Rim of Fire, very prone to earthquakes, volcanoes, and typhoons. We are ranked fourth by the Global Climate Risk Index among countries most affected by extreme weather events from 2000 to 2019. And we are the fifth most vulnerable country in terms of disaster risk implications for development capacity. Uh, we also, of course, understand that in the Philippines, we face inequitable growth and high poverty. And we're also experiencing, until now, the longest-running insurgency in Asia. So for our research, uh, the Leyte, uh, Leyte province, which is located in Eastern Visayas in 2012, it was the poorest region in, uh, in the, um, uh, yeah, it, it was uh, uh, noted as the poorest region in 2012. It was also characterized by huge economic inequalities when Typhoon Yolanda hit, and it's also a struggling local economy still dependent on natural resources like agriculture. And of course, for political scientists and public administration scholars, we have long noted the continuing patronage politics and uh, the dominance of local elites, particularly political families. So in terms of the, the impact or the immediate effect of uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, the total damage according to the ND NDRRMC data of 2014 was uh, 1.8 uh, billion US uh, dollars um, in terms of recorded uh, dead, 6,193, 1,161 missing, and 28,689 injured. Uh, people were affected in terms of livelihood, environmental, and food security were 16 million with nearly 4.4 million uh, displaced. So when we look at uh, what is the national framework, uh, what are the national frameworks guiding the Philippines in terms of responding to disasters, the Philippines is a signatory and therefore should be observing the framework set by the Hyogo Framework for Action and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And these two frameworks actually transform the way we see disasters. That when we look at disasters, we not only talk about uh, relief operations, but we should actually talk about disaster prevention, disaster re uh, risk reduction, and uh, preventing uh, 
more people and livelihoods from being affected by impending disasters. When we look at laws uh, regarding disasters, the Philippines actually has a strong set of policies, frameworks, and plans for DRRM. The DRRM Law of 2010 created the NDRRMC and established local councils at various local government levels to replicate the NDRRMC's responsibilities. It also recognizes the role of civil society organizations in the RRM. We also have the Office of Civil Defense under the Department of National Defense, which is the implementing arm of the NDRRMC. We also have the Climate Change Act of 2009, which places disaster risk reduction as the first line of defense against climate change risk. So, if, so in terms of laws, we are not actually um, uh, lacking in terms of guidelines and frameworks on how to deal with disasters and impending disasters. However, in reality, uh, local councils are of, uh, often understaffed, underbudgeted, or lacking professionalization and awareness, and a significant gap exists. The NDRRMC cannot supervise all the local councils. And uh, when uh, Typhoon Yolanda hit, there were LGUs without the RRM plans, and even if they have the RRM plans, um, some of them have no adequate staff or budget to, uh, to actually support their plans. In terms of general guidelines for foreign and international agencies, the RRM assistance, there are points for partnership and coordination with foreign and international agencies. There's a national government cluster system and the U United Nations cluster system under the UN OCHA, which actually pre-existed uh, Haiyan. They were existing even before 2013. Uh, they were set up uh, after the devastation caused by uh, Ondoy. Uh, there's also an existing parallel system with the armed forces of the Philippines through the Multinational Coordination Council. So we are part of a multi-level governance structure regarding uh, the RRM. So the UN cluster system, this is uh, the UN cluster system in terms of humanitarian and emergency relief coordination. And there are specific UN agencies in charge of uh, specific areas like what to do uh, before, during, and after disasters. Uh, and this is replicated at the level of uh, the Philippine government where we have lead agencies in terms of uh, specific areas when it comes to disaster. So nutrition, water, sanitation, emergency shelter, logistics, education, and agriculture. Um, however, there are limits despite having a national institutional framework. Some departments during Typhoon Yolanda bypassed the NDRRMC coordination and the Office of Civil Defense, and they work independently. Even the creation of the Office of the Presidential Assistant for Rehabilitation and Recovery may have added another level and further confusion in terms of which agencies are really in charge of uh, rehabilitation. Despite substantial devolution and coordination frameworks in place, many of the local government units have limited technical and financial capacity and in the process got overwhelmed by the devastation or uninformed about the protocols or procedures needed, or they have other priorities other than disaster uh, risk reduction. Many local constituents were informed about the super typhoon before the typhoon hit, but many of them were rel reluctant to leave for varying reasons, and they were also uninformed about what to do during disasters. Political rivalries also between the national and local governments, political alliances, and patronage politics got in the way of more efficient response. Um, we definitely saw uh, a very big role of uh, foreign and international agencies right after uh, Yolanda. Country, um, some uh, Observers noted that countries were far more generous than usual. The UN emergency response pegged uh, their response during Yolanda as L3, which was the highest. And according to the DDM in 2015, um, 
the Philippines received uh, 1.64 billion cash and non-cash aid pledges in U.S. dollars. And according uh, to UN OCHA, the estimate is 865,151,861,866 U.S. dollars from UN OCHA alone. Uh, what have we noted about uh, the interplay of the national and local frameworks with, with um, international uh, and foreign uh, agencies in terms of their interventions during Typhoon Yolanda? Based on various assessments, the national government played an integral role during the response efforts with the international UN cluster system joining the government cluster system and with most foreign agencies saying that coordination was good for the most part. However, different reports also highlight significant tensions between the government and international NGOs as the latter's response led to the sudden influx of international actors, which undermined the usual procedures and relationships established by the Philippine government. Some foreign agencies also did not consult government agencies and communities in terms of priority needs of the community. Uh, we also noted that there are cases of different actors working, working in parallel and duplicating their efforts alongside cases of exemplary programming and collaboration. Parallel efforts occurred because of the following, and this is based on our interviews and our analysis. Some national NGOs were unaware of the cluster system and the system them also did not actively engage national NGOs. Some LGUs were also unaware of the cluster system or they were weak because of the disaster. Some international NGOs, organizations, and individuals distrust, distrusted the national agencies, local governments, and local governments, and they avoided collaboration and coordination. They went straight to uh, certain sectors and com communities. Coordination was also difficult due to the scale of the disaster. The NDRRMC also has a number of weaknesses and limitations, and the AFP had difficulties. Remember that in 2013, there was also the Bohol earthquake, and before that, the Zamboanga siege. So the result was, the results were market distortion. Many families and individuals received multiple cash and other items, but others did not. Uh, for instance, some uh, NGOs went directly to the people without consulting NGOs and local government units about which areas should be prioritized or which areas uh, require more assistance. So the tendency was there were those who received more duplicated aid while others did not receive anything. We also noted a number of uh, exemplary programs. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list. This is only based on what uh, we have uh, observed and often mentioned by many of our uh, our informants. Uh, the UN WASH and protection clusters, uh, they were successful in their interventions because long before Super Typhoon Yolanda, they already have a history of engagement with many uh, players in the area. The UN OCHA, of course, which was familiar with uh, the terrain and the how to work with national and uh, local actors, Catholic Relief Services, UNDP's Holistic Livelihood Programs, World Vision, Oxfam's uh, new uh, standard operating procedures, they were able to adjust in terms of uh, localizing the responses and the the interventions immediately after Yolanda. And um, the Pope Francis village was an example of a re relocation site which incorporated the voices and the participation of the people in crafting what would be appropriate livelihood programs uh, for people who relocated in this particular village. We also noted that among the three uh, LGUs that we studied, the municipality of Tanawan was the first Yolanda hit local government unit to submit a completed rehabilitation plan to the national government. Uh, its LGU designated 
sectorial focal persons to coordinate relief efforts and system and the system allowed coordination and assignments of relief efforts on rebuilding across barangay. So what were the impact of interventions of these various interventions of different governance actors on human security and resilience of different areas? Some international agencies were able to provide short-term employment. However, the problem now is how to sustain livelihood opportunities for many of the Yolanda areas. Some barangays still complain about food scarcity, either because they do not have the money to buy food or the place where they are staying, particularly uh, in some resettlement areas, are very far from places like the sea and the farms to source food and livelihood. New infrastructure projects like barangay health centers have been set up in some areas, but access to health services and insurance like affordable medicine is still an issue in many areas, especially in resettlement uh, areas. Some sectors like the elderly and the persons with disabilities need more assistance in this particular area. State housing, particularly in relocation areas and on-site uh, areas, is still an important uh, issue. May, we also noted that many individuals and communities still suffer from a number of vulnerabilities. We, uh, many of them complained about lack of sustainable livelihood, inadequate and unsafe housing. And um, uh, at the same time also, we noted that um, some of the areas, the resettlement areas where very prone to flooding and according to our contacts from UP Tacloban, uh, they were often, the areas are often flooded um, by the past few uh, typhoons uh, in the past few years. Uh, there, is also, there, was also, there is also inadequate provision of utilities such as water and electricity and incomplete infrastructure such as roads and drainage in the resettlement area. Um, the capacity to protect themselves, their families, and communities from future disasters and day-to-day -day safety issues remain tenuous in many cases. However, some agencies that remained have been giving a number of barangays trainings in the RRM, budgeting, and planning. And for a short time, foreign and international agencies replace local and national patrons as communities become heavily dependent on them. So in terms of, let me... Uh, go to my conclusions because of um, uh, time constraints. Both national and local governance mechanisms and programs in the RRM have not been adequate for Yolanda's impact. While significant and comprising majority of interventions during the release phase and in a limited sense in the recovery phase, the assistance from international and national non-state actors have not addressed most of the human security concerns of people as well as resilience in the three areas that we went to. There were questions about the priorities of these aid agencies, duplication of aid, and whether they took into consideration the inputs and the actual needs of the people and communities affected. In some cases, they replicated the patron-client relations. It is also the nature of aid that it is only temporary. Some aid agencies' mandate is only in the relief phase and not in the reconstruction and development phase. So, in terms of lessons learned moving forward, we need stronger national and local disaster frameworks that where we could see more improved coordination with national and local governments in the lead in terms of identification, distribution, and prioritization of appropriate aid. Uh, national government agencies need more capacity building. Uh, capacity building is also needed among local governments and the, the various stakeholders at the local government level, particularly civil society organizations and local communities. There's a need to com for community empowerment and localization so that when interventions come, they know what to do and what people need. People have plans and people were the ones who crafted these plans and, uh, and uh, programs for disaster. And we also need a more strengthened international coordination and response, not only at the UN level, but also at the ASEAN level, particularly since we already have an existing ASEAN agreement for disaster management and emergency response. I think we have 
more to talk about right uh, after the Q&A. Thank you very much.